thank you very much for the kind introduction. Information is everywhere. Every day, we send emails, we access the internet, we make video calls, we post pictures on Facebook and videos on YouTube, we search for information, we tweet, we Instagram. Every day, humanity collectively creates three billion gigabytes of data. If we were to put all this data onto Blu-ray discs, it would make a stack of disk which reaches almost to the top of the stratosphere, 60 kilometers above our heads. <coughs> Information has become essential to our daily lives, so much so that, um, uh, that this information is as essential to us as light, energy, heat, water and sanitation. We have come to depend on information so much, but not only just on the availability, but on the expectation that the capabilities of our smartphones and our computing objects will continue to improve. We live truly in the information age. Information, at the heart of information, is computing technology. It, computing means many different things to different people. It means high-performance computing or supercomputing to the scientist who is trying to solve large-scale problems, like weather prediction, molecular modeling, or the simulation of a nuclear reaction. It means games consoles or virtual reality for the young and the young at heart playing Gran Turismo or, uh, or FIFA. For companies, it's uh, server stations and data backup. It's the cloud where data is held, and increasingly where work is being done. And perhaps most visibly to us, it's the smartphones in our pockets and the laptops in our briefcases. All this has been made possible by uh, electronic technology and 70 years of progress of scaling down from the macro scale to the nano scale, where devices have dimensions of just a few billionths of a meter. The first general purpose computer was built in 1946, and it was called ENIAC. It weighed 30 tons, it occupied 60 cubic meters of space, and it required 150 kilowatts or 150,000 watts of power. That's the equivalent of the power requirements of a small village. It had 100,000 components, and it was capable of doing 5,000 operations per second. And at the time, this was a revolution. It's a thousand times faster than electromechanical, uh, computers, and it was capable of doing an artillery trajectory calculation in just 30 seconds. The same calculation took, and still takes, a human over two and a half hours to complete by hand. Now, fast forward to today, after the invention of the transistor, the integrated circuit, the first Intel microprocessor, and decades of reducing the dimensions of electronic component technology, and today we have advanced processors which pack 10 billion devices into just 400 cubic millimeters and are able to do 200 billion calculations per second. Now, the technology behind ENIAC was vacuum tubes, centimeter-scale components about as large as my thumb. Today's components are CMOS transistors, which are just a few billionths of a meter, 40 nanometers in dimension. The scale of this reduction is such that today we have more transistors in a processor than people in the world. There are incidentally more processors in this room than there are people. And if we were to scale up a chip so that the transistor is the size of a house, and one side of the chip starts here in this room, then the other side of the chip would be in New Zealand, and with houses or transistors all the way. This scaling down of dimensions has been a staggering feat of human engineering prowess and is surely a modern miracle. However, it has not been achieved without cost. Even if a single chip costs orders of magnitude less, obviously, than, than ENIAC, uh, manufacturing cost is still huge to draw these systems at extraordinarily fine lines. It needs extremely pure water, ultra-filtered uh, air, 
uh, the majority, in fact, most of the naturally occurring chemical elements, very finely controlled light sources and very detailed masks, and 300 or over 300 distinct processing steps to achieve the fabrication of a, uh, of a chip. And putting all this together uh, leads to an environment, building and equipment which is so advanced that it costs many billions of dollars today to build a state-of-the-art semiconductor manufacturing plant. An even bigger challenge which is facing us is the energy consumption of our information-related activities. Obviously, energy consumption for mobile units is extraordinarily important because it defines how long we can use, for example, our smartphone without having to recharge the battery. The recent scandal of mobile phone units catching fire is a dramatic illustration of just how much energy smartphones really need and what happens if the batteries are unstable. If we focus on the data centers, which is where data is held, where information is held, then we have typical power consumption figures of 2,000 kilowatts or 2 million watts. Um, and if we add all the data centers together in the world and calculate out how much energy they use in a year, we get to 100 billion kilowatt hours in one year, which is the equivalent of the energy produced by 10 nuclear power stations. If we add to this all the access points, which are our smartphones, laptops, servers and communication infrastructure to get to the data centers, then we can double or even triple the energy consumption. And this gives us another 20 or 30 uh, nuclear power stations, which in all then means that we use a significant part of the nuclear power stations in the world to supply the energy to our information-related activities. Luckily, we believe that uh, nanotechnology can come to the rescue here. Even though electronics will stop getting smaller in just a few years, there are other nanotechnologies which exist and which are actually better at certain functions than the electronics, but which have been overlooked in the race for scaling down. Already, some chips are making the use of the third dimension, the vertical dimension, to stack chips with different technologies where each layer in the chip is actually using a technology which is dedicated and more efficient at a given function. Silicon photonics is one of these uh, technologies, and photonics is good at communication. An illustration of this is that we use optics and photonics and light all the time to communicate data, to carry large volumes of data. An example is optical fibers, which carry data between continents, between mobile base stations, and also bring high-speed internet and high-definition TV into our homes. Silicon photonics is the reduction of scale in the optical or photonic components which are required to make these communication infrastructures, the lasers, the photodiodes, and the fibers. Now, one of the uh, key issues that we had initially in our lab uh, to prove that these um, uh, silicon photonic systems could work is proving that we could integrate photonic devices on top of silicon chips. At the nanoscale, this is actually not easy because the materials are different and therefore the atomic structures do not align. But by using a sacrificial layer between the two, we did prove that it is now possible to tightly integrate photonic devices on top of working electronic chips. We also proved that it's possible to build complete photonic networks on a single uh, electronic processor chip to make highly efficient, highly energy efficient uh, communication between processor cores or even between processors themselves in data centers. Uh, this example here uh, shows that we can use also another property of light, which is that light is built off of several wavelengths or several colors. So each color can, in fact, carry different pieces of information. And in this way, we can get to an extraordinarily high data carrying capacity in photonic networks communicating between uh, processors. And we also proved that if we use this kind of network, between sets of processor cores, it actually gives us a speed up in the uh, running of software on the processors themselves.
So maybe in the future, the processors in the smartphones in your pockets will not just work with electronics, but also with light and photonics. Now, looking to the future, we will always need computers to do number crunching. The initial rationale for computing was to build machines that were capable of doing calculations that a human would just take too long to do. But increasingly today, we need computers to think and react intelligently to draw insight and inference from large, unstructured sets of partial data. Artificial intelligence can do this. Um, uh, to, and we already use uh, this kind of computing to, do, uh, to detect bank fraud, to carry out surveillance, security surveillance, to understand natural language and predict consumer interests. For example, uh, Apple's Siri, Google Voice Search, Microsoft Cortana are all examples of virtual assistants which, which use artificial intelligence technology. However, running such a complex application on a conventional processor actually requires huge amounts of computing power and therefore huge amounts of energy. So we believe that nanotechnology can also offer alternatives uh, to this model and provide ways to achieve a hardware platform capable of running artificial intelligence applications. For example, we can build artificial electronic neurons and artificial photonic synapses to build a complete artificial neural computation platform, which could then run this kind of artificial intelligence uh, application with a fraction of the energy required to run it on conventional processors, and maybe even less than that of the human brain. And this, coupled with miniaturized sensors, which again will be uh, enabled by nanotechnology will lead to, for example, drones and robots which are capable of intervening in emergency response units and help save lives in natural or man-made disasters, to predict and avoid climate change, intelligent prosthetics to eliminate handicap, for helping uh, the elderly to live their lives to the full, and uh, to help agriculture to use just the right amount of water and fertilizer uh, to grow their crops. So nanotechnology, which has been such a powerful force for change in the information revolution, will continue imperceptibly to transform our lives in the future. Thank you.